Hello, thank you for joining us again for another episode of the Best of the West Book Club with me and Dr. Robillard. I was fired from Eton and he left teaching at Oxford because we were dissatisfied with the stifling environment, the woke takeover, which many people are so familiar with in schools and universities. This book club is going through a selection of works that we feel are neglected and which outline important concepts for understanding the confusion in contemporary culture, because really all these ideas go back to philosophical first principles. Small mistakes in the beginning lead to big ones at the end. And we have got a lesson full of fascinating mistakes for you today. Dr. Roblard, you must be looking forward to this. I am. Yeah, this is uh, it's a once over the world tour of my, uh, my grad experience. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it'd be good. You know these problems inside out. Let's begin with our prayer so we don't get infected by these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sounds like a plan. All right, I'll bring this to the front and then you lead us through, please. Come Holy Spirit, divine creator, true source of light and fountain of wisdom. Pour forth your brilliance upon my dense intellect. Dissipate the darkness which covers me that of sin and of ignorance. Grant me a penetrating mind to understand, a retentive memory, method and ease in learning, lucidity to comprehend, and abundant grace in expressing myself. Guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This I ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true man, living and reigning with you and the Father forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, we mentioned that this is like a horror show from some of your grad school experience in philosophy. And although I haven't done even undergraduate studies in philosophy, many of these problems have personally bothered me. And I've been depressed about some of them. Like I'd wake up mm -hmm. thinking about them and I think, what's going on with this? I need to read more books on this, find the answer. It's impacting the way I see myself, other people my whole life and I think that people more and more are feeling that once some of these get under your skin it's hard to get them out and you don't know where they've actually attacked you from mm -hmm. yeah I, I agree very much uh it's also that that quote that you mentioned the other time where it's the uh you know the last thing a fish sees is the water and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today it, it is the the water of modernity or, or the presupp presuppositions of modernity that in a lot of ways are that do have this this way of maybe bothering a lot of folks in, in a lot of maybe uh unexpressed ways mm. and uh if we can start bringing them out in, into more explicit fashion then we can see well just what it is what is it about the, the modern condition that we find so off yeah exactly and even if you aren't aware of these as the ultimate philosophical root of a malaise that you are feeling, they can still affect you because you are within the radar, as it were, the, the consequences of the ideas. They are felt in this sense that there's no, there's no meaning, there's no value, and there's no purpose. And what Aquinas does, what Aristotle does, is basically gives us a vocabulary to be able to dissect this with, because mm -hmm. as we've said again and again, it comes back to the question of final causes, ultimately. That is going to be important in this lesson. So how did we get into this mess then? Fraser says that right at the start, the game must be rigged so that Aristotle and St. Thomas cannot even get onto the field. People are under this misconception that at one point, Aristotelian metaphysics was refuted. He was just wrong. And someone figured this out, wrote a book or gave a lecture, and everyone thought, right, now we need to abandon Aristotle. But that's not mm. really what happened, is it? Right, right. Well, I think also sort of humming in the background of this is this just assumed Whig interpretation of history where we think, like, we're just always progressing and whatever came before is somehow uh, obsolete and uh, lesser than whatever came after it. Uh, and I mean, anyone who ever, ever has been lost walking in the woods uh, can realize that that's not the case. You know, you can you can get way off course. Uh, so, you know, but nonetheless, I think that that 
Whig interpretation of history is still that has a lot of um, power in convincing people that, well, yeah, whatever, we, we had this Aristotelian moment and then we've improved and we moved past it. And uh, that's that's old news. Um, now, a lot of that, I think, gets um, some motivation or some intuitions pumped in virtue of scientific claims advancing but aristotelianism or the you know the full aristotelian picture is not refuted at all uh it's just assumed that it has been in virtue of certain scientific advancements okay good let's say a bit more about that so modern science is exciting tells us new things about the world that aristotle wasn't aware of even things about the planets and what rotates around what etc the positions of things and that can make you think that the entire Aristotelian system is somehow wrong. But you're saying mm -hmm. that, that would be a delusion. That's not warranted. Exactly. Yeah. Now, why not? How yeah. come the metaphysics underlying some of the scientific claims that weren't even Aristotle's, but just ones that he accepted, because they were the ones at the time that everyone thought were true, based on the evidence he had available. Why right. are the metaphysics beneath those undefected? Well, the metaphysics that we had we've uh, articulated before with respect to the four causes, act and potency, and um, features like that 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 is still intact. Th those metaphysical foundations are still there, independent of whatever maybe new empirical uh, data about planetary orbit that came in. Uh, so th those things just come apart, I think, in in a pretty serious way. And it's also the case that uh, Fraser stresses that the, the metaphysical claims that Aristotle makes and that Aquinas also incorporates into his system, they aren't in principle the kind of thing that science could refute. Why not? Right. Uh, well, I guess this is just, it comes down to metaphysical presuppositions versus features of induction. And, uh, and the scientific me method and, and, and running certain falsifiable tests within a certain scientific paradigm. Uh, so Arist Aristotelianism broadly construed is it's bigger. It subsumes the scientific paradigm that we're, we're doing a, a chemistry test in, for instance. Yeah, I think that's a great way to explain it. It subsumes the paradigm. So we've discussed in previous lessons how science brings with it various metaphysical assumptions that science itself cannot prove or test. And what we're saying is that the Aristotelian metaphysics are exactly that kind of thing. So they're prior to science, more fundamental than it, deeper than it. And if anybody was going to try to refute them, it would be on a metaphysical level, not on the scientific level. Right. Okay. Yeah. Why though? Would anybody want to rig the game so that Aristotle and St. Thomas can't get onto the field? Well, I guess uh, certain motivations. I, 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 for one, think that the Thirty Years' War had a lot of influence upon this, right? Where you have a lot of violence in Europe where people with strong convictions about religious commitments killing one another. And then after that, Collectively, people go, well, strong convictions lead to people fighting and killing one another. We don't want that. So we're, we're going to start adopting, you know, what eventually becomes a, a Lockean uh, tenet of religious tolerance and, you know, the Westphalian model of, you know, nation states and, and distancing between um, church and state and whatnot. I think that that's in the, the intellectual waters that the modernists are writing. Uh, whether or not they are explicitly knowledgeable about it at all. Mm. Um, and then the other things that we mentioned before is that people get get to, uh, to have fun with, um, you know, sex and hedonism if uh, uh, you remove God out of the picture uh, or things that point towards a creator that, uh, that has a moral order of things. You know, if you can remove that, then you can have your fun. And uh, uh, that, that certainly, I think, is a motivation. And then also the enlightenment desire to to want to like control nature and bend it to man's will. Uh, I think that's also in the mix as well. Yeah. And the problem with allowing Aristotle and St. Thomas onto the field is that 
that you have arguments that once you accept their premises, and these are common sense empirical premises combined with elements of rationalism that are also common sense, then you mm. are rationally stuck with God, soul, etc. So these moral are, boundaries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. These are difficult uh, arguments to refute. So the mm. best way to actually deal with them is just to say we're not going to take them seriously. And we yeah. find the subject in such a way that we just dodge them. And mm. then we can have our way with our lives the way we want them to be, rather than this annoying business of there's a human nature and it's all towards God and the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. I think this is also like a, it's a, a weird perversion of Occam's razor where people, they're like, oh, well, you know, parsimony. Well, I can get a lot of parsimony if, if I just chuck out whole areas of metaphysics and just reduce everything to a point where it's, uh, it's just reduced to a single narrow sliver of reality. Uh, I think that's a, a misunderstanding of, of, of what Occam meant by parsimony, though. Mm. Uh, Fazer has some good points about that, doesn't he? He says that the um, objections, the superfluity objection, um, is considered mm -hmm. by Aquinas himself. So do we really need to have God? And his argument is that, no, it's it's necessary. And mm -hmm. it's been dealt with already. And the idea that yeah. new atheists thought that this would be a devastating blow shows they just haven't familiarized themselves with the history of thought on the topic. Like we said before, they're not even original with their mistakes. <laughs> That's it. Oh, we've got a question. Um, why didn't the Crusades prompt Western philosophers to dump Aristotle? That was lots of religious conflict then. It was, but it wasn't an internal uh, religious conflict with it, within between Christian factions over Christian stuff. Uh, so I think that that's probably the, the main reason. It was far, far, far away enough for it to be uh, not considered yeah. as impactful. Yeah, I'd agree. So the Crusades, no matter what people might tell you, were essentially defensive wars in response to Islamic expansion. There was the extra motivation that getting a bunch of young guys with high testosterone who were beating each other up at tournaments and being rowdy like young men do, if we could get them all fighting a, a common opponent external, that's better for people in Europe. But there was no sense of uh, these big religious conflicts between Catholics and Protestants, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good answer. Now, um, we've got this idea then that we can get rid of final causes. And you mentioned uh, Occam's razor and things being superfluous and stripping it down to the bare minimum. That was a big part of the motivation. But Feyerza argues that once you eliminate final causes, then basically the mechanistic come naturalistic world picture is the universal acid. Mm. And he has this great phrase about Occam uh, pulverizing reality down into just these isolated individual components. There's no mm. essences. What does that really mean? So if we... Yeah, if we remove universals, re remove essences, and, and now we're stuck with our, our little particulars, then if, if that's the the um, the worldview, if that's the lens with which we're, we're reviewing our world, then you're going to see that it's going to materialize in our understanding of causality. And it's going to understand, it's going to it's going to bleed over into our conception of, of humankind. So this ends up being almost a forerunner for the, the atomized individual, the, the enlightenment liberal individual that is cleaved of, of any family, of any culture, of any, any national um, identity. It's just, you know, you're, you're just this, the, the human individual becomes the analog to the, the atomized uh, causal particle. And, and neither of those things have any, they have no final cause that, that, that overarching thing that they, they take part in. And even more than just disconnection from family or nation, we end with transgenderism, for example, don't we? Disconnection from, yeah, from um, truth, from, from any anchor point at all. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit more about how that happens, because ultimately, I think that is where we end up. And this is mm -hmm. a theme that we've stressed in previous chapters, too. Fazer says that secularism ultimately can provide no rational foundation for the most important things in life and, in fact, reason itself. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the most obvious things in life, too. You know, it's like this, this really does become a case of sophists becoming too smart for their own good. Right. So ideas have consequences and you might not figure out exactly what ideas are the problem until the consequences get bad enough. And then you mm -hmm. have to retrace your steps and think, OK, which ones? Why? Where did we go wrong? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the full flowering of the removal of final causes in various areas now. Mm. So the mind body problem, something that I'm sure you would have encountered in your grad school studies. Fazer mm. says that there's this problem that they just can't seem to account for the mind. What is it? Why is it such a big problem? Why is there a mind body problem? And he argues that, well, of course there is because so far, everything that doesn't fit the mechanistic model has been swept under the rug of the mind, which is a, a good image to bear in mind. Mm. What is the mechanistic model? Remind us of that. And in, in what way have all these things that don't fit been swept under the rug? Right. So, yeah, so the, the mechanistic model is the so imagine our four causes, but we've removed final causality. So what that's going to do now, it's going to permeate every, every area now of metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, and identity. So in terms of uh, metaphysics and epistemology, our, our view of conception is going to, or, or causality, our conception of conce causality is going to be off. So rather than causation being inherent in the, the thing itself, where you can have... Um, the, the powers of a particular thing uh, as a brick goes through the window, translating. Uh, now you just have really inv invisible particles doing something uh, in a, a billiard ball fashion underneath. And uh, now we're stuck trying to figure out, well, how, you know, how does causality and causation connect up and whatnot? Um, with respect to the mind body problem, uh, now I'm, I'm left with. How do I explain qualia? How do I explain intentionality? Which, you know, the, the intentionality of the mind has to be the clearest instance of something that has a telos or a final end to it. Uh, that's kind of free floating. Uh, I've removed hylomorphism. So how it is that that and free will and agency is able to connect up and uh, connect up to my senses and apprehension of the world and my uh, motor functioning in the world is, is lost. Um, those, yeah, so th those are some of the unexpected side effects once we break Telos off from mm. the, uh, the the worldview that we have. Yeah, that was a, a lot. And e each one of those, I think, would be a talking point in itself. Let's just choose one. I think it'll make it nice and clear. Uh, you mentioned qualia there. Uh, that's mm -hmm. probably a new word for some people listening. Uh, yep. What is it? And why does it show that things have been swept under the rug? Because my understanding of this mechanistic model is <coughs> that basically we have um, colorless, uh, odorless matter. That's the basic conception of what the physical, the material world is. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow when we look around us, things, they smell, they have color. And how can yep. this be if matter itself lacks all of those things? Mm -hmm. Now, that's what qualia is, right? So what it looks yeah. like to be looking at a yellow book or a red book. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the redness of a red apple. Where, where is it to be located? It's not, you know, it's, it's not reducible to whatever the particles in the apple bouncing around. Or the, the, the wetness of water is not, um, you know, located in H2O. Right. Uh, it's not the kind of thing you could capture in an equation. So, I mean, where, where does it go then? It's, it's there. It's in our experience. Mm -hmm. it, this is where yeah. the sweeping under the rug comes in, right? Yeah. Yeah, we need um, to appeal to, I guess, maybe if you're Locke, you can 
start appealing to uh, primary and sec secondary properties. Uh, that might be a uh, uh, some mechanism to just to to move wh where I'm going to put qualia. If I'm Dan Dennett, I go well. This is just it's it's all just epiphenomenal, and it all just reduces, and and there's no such thing. Um, yeah, that's another way to do it. Uh, it's just a hardcore limitativist. Uh, but yeah, it's, we're left wanting as to like how is it that we have this this free floating property that we can't really locate in the in the mechanistic uh, worldview that we just build. Right. So not even the properties of matter, strictly speaking, are matter, and mm -hmm. because we can't explain them in those terms, we just say, okay, fine, they can go in this other thing called the mind. Um, yeah. which we don't know yet, but we'll explain at some point in a materialistic mm -hmm. way. Otherwise, we're just going to say it doesn't exist. We'll eliminate it entirely, Right. Yeah. which is what some of them do. And they'll just That's say, what Dennett does, yeah. yeah. Right, so we can't account for rationality on a materialistic model. Uh, therefore, it doesn't exist. I'm not really rational mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. so that's, a, that's, that's the, um, I don't know, you, you see these things kind of go, it almost becomes just fashion. It becomes fashion to reduce everything, you know, to reduce to the to the point of elimination, and that that somehow it's it's it counts as somehow being um, a philosophically sophisticated or a philosophical advancement. You know, mm -hmm. we're we're just um, helping people realize all all these phantasms that they thought thought were real. You know, we're we're getting rid of them as well. You know. Right. And this applies to some of the things that we're actually intimately familiar with um, on the level in which we can be certain of things like uh, there is an external world. Um, it has these features. Uh, we experience the reality of free will directly. The, the claim is that, no, these things are illusions somehow. And you have to start mm -hmm. wondering at some point, well, what's the motivation really for trying to claim these are illusions? And it is just that it doesn't fit this particular paradigm for which in the first place, we haven't got any particularly strong reasons to accept anyway, and very good reasons not to accept it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think a lot of times, yeah, people just, they just inherit these assumptions as part of the milieu that they're in. And mm. They, and then they just start moving forward and, and don't ever look back as to, well, why, why did we just accept this framework? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned induction earlier as one of your examples of things that disappear when final causes are eradicated. And you gave the example of the, the brick smashing the window, which we've discussed before. And in fact, Fazer says that if, if we do remove that, then there's no objective reason why any cause should produce such and such an effect or range of effects. Now, what mm. are the implications of this for even trying to do science? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Hume, the the uh, person who is most attributed with this, you know, famously has this quote where he says, uh, "You know, all these problems they they plague me when I'm in my study, but then I go and I." drink ale and play backgammon with my friends and they don't bother me anymore. It's just like, at some point you have to wonder, did, did he ever step back and ask himself, like, how is it that I play backgammon with my friends? How is it that I, I, you know, I navigate my, it's somehow, you know, it's, so it seems per performatively at least he didn't, didn't believe what he was saying. Uh, you know, he did nav navigate the world as if, there were inductive laws as if there was like, you could do some, some uh, type of naive empiricism upon the world and, and uh, account for regularity, law like regularities. Uh, so you wonder to what extent, how self-aware he was when he was saying these things. Yeah. In a way, the, the way that they live is a, a strong reason to doubt that the ideas they are suggesting are, are viable at all. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to yeah. take it seriously. And that's a good reason why we shouldn't either. Right. They right. simply don't ma mesh with reality or enable them to, to navigate it sensibly. Yeah. 
once you're out of the ivory tower, none of this really holds much water at all. What what would an example be of trying to do science then without there being any good reason why any cause should cause a particular effect? Let's think of like a, a chemistry experiment, for example. You mentioned different substances having different powers. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. According to this worldview, that's all nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. I, can, yeah, I, I can't make any rational jump between anything I've, I've any regularity I've witnessed in the past to any p- predictive future claims. Uh, that's just not on the table. So what about your, your um, military experience then? What if you're trying to, um, detonate, uh, some explosives? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I'm just, uh, just, just mixing some things and I'm hoping, hoping for the best. <laughs> if I'm in, uh, I'm in the human or the modernist world, right? You know, that's, that's all it comes down to. Yeah. There's nothing um, in the nature of the explosives that should make them explode. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen the next time? Right. Maybe yeah. It could turn, it could turn into an ice cream sundae, you know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right. Now, free will is another big problem. And we've mentioned um, why both free will and intellect stand or fall together. So these two things are the image of God in human beings, intellect Mm -hmm. and free will. So unlike other animals, we are rational because we make choices based on reason rather than just having mere instincts. And this is what free will ultimately is. So we we choose what is good for us based on rationality. But Fraser says that on the mechanistic worldview, human behavior differs in degree, but not in kind, from the behavior of billiard balls and soap suds. So Mm. if we picture a nightclub, for example, and we're thinking, what's going on here? Uh, Why is that person chatting up that person? Well, on the mechanistic worldview, first of all, there aren't any persons. There are no persons, yeah. 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 That's a big problem with the nightclub already. And what are we actually witnessing then? Depends, I I guess, on your level of description, right? So some folks, like Dennett, might say uh, we're we're witnessing just mere... Well, Dawkins might say we're just witnessing selfish genes doing selfish gene stuff for procreation and 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 uh, it's mechan- not, not for anything though, is it really? For anything, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're just we're just watching watching the bill the selfish gene billiard balls. If we drop down a, lo- a level of description beneath that, we might say uh, it's chemicals doing stuff. We we drop a uh, a, a more fine grained level of description below that. It's just just brute physics, just doing things. There, there aren't even human bodies there. It's just just the physics. And uh, yeah, you've you've eliminated in any any notion of personhood or agency uh, at all, uh, ostensibly because the the latest neuroscience says so. But then, of course, that's helping itself to such things as I don't know scientific consensus amongst other rational scientists, yeah, yeah. which assumes minds. But you know, never mind that. Yeah. Um, so. Blind chance and necessity then. Particles just smashing into each other for no reason ultimately at all. That's the Mm -hmm. picture of not just human life, but all life ultimately. Everything, yeah. And that is a product of the particular conceptual lens that we're looking at things through. One Mm -hmm. which also can't account for the fact that anything we're looking at even has... uh, color for example Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep okay yeah um what about descartes then so why was it that his attempt to salvage some sense of what a human being is by saying no there's this soul it's not entirely mechanistic we have the soul and human beings do have some measure of choice he conceived of it as a physical substance of some sort, but he tried to avoid some of these consequences. He was still left with the mind-body problem of how the will could actually do anything in the world. 
Well, why was that? And how come Aristotle or Aquinas don't face that on the hylomorphic view? On the hylomorphic view, you you have a union of these aspects of mind and body. Whereas if Descartes is assuming that there's a, a disembodied mind and then a mechanistic body, now you're, you're stuck with like a, a ghost of the machine problem. You're, um, you're Patrick Swayze in Ghost, where the ghost teaches him to, to, to flick the bottle cap, right? And uh, Patrick Swayze's finger keeps going through it. Uh, so we're, we're stuck with these, these two, two presumed metaphysical worlds that there's a, um, causal interrelation problem that can't be, that's just presumed to be, I guess, uh, impossible to, to bridge. Right. Or, 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 or you know, there's a, a pseudo problem that's assumed. Yeah. That, that there's no mind body problem on the hylomorphic view where the, the soul just is the form of the body. Yeah. Um, why not? Um, I forget what Fazer says here. Well, I think it's because I kind of, in the phrasing of the question, summed up the main point, which is that we don't have two separate things that are struggling to interact. There's no mm -hmm. interface problem, right? Right. Yeah. They, yeah, they just are, it's, it's a necessary feature of just how, how they're made, just what they are. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it, it sounds um, simplistic, but I think that really is it. It's because it's a, um, a holistic view of what the human being is. We don't have like a little guy inside doing the driving. It comes mm -hmm. back to the whole idea of what the essence of a human is. Yeah. Whereas Descartes is like an extreme version of the, the sweeping under the rug. It gets almost, swept out of the body and you can't understand how to mm -hmm. get a handle how, to affect yes. it at all. Yeah. Um, and it, a topic that I know you are interested in personally, uh, what happens to rights when we abandon final causality? Uh, Fraser says that there was this attempt to have rights because Locke in particular uh, reacted with horror to Hobbes's idea that in the the state of nature, according to Hobbes, we have no rights. It's all just mm -hmm. a war of all against all, and that we have this uh, contract uh, theory of rights where we just agree to treat each other nicely under the power of the state, and this is what keeps everything under control. And mm -hmm. Locke thinks no. There's more to it than that. But Fazer says, ultimately, what we're left with is if there's no concept of what a human being is, then how do we even decide what a human being is in the first place? Who gets to do that? So every mm -hmm. human being has natural rights. Fine. That's a nice idea, isn't it? But we get to decide who is a human being and who isn't. So mm -hmm. a fetus, for example, no rights. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that gets that that gets thrown out because we've uh, yeah we've lost we've lost telos. There's there's no potential for that fetus to become a fully fleshed out um, person with a life and a, 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 a as somebody who's already been born. Yeah. Okay, so this in the first lesson we talked about how these questions are fundamental to hot button political ones like abortion that's a great example of it right mm -hmm. so a, a fetus is no longer an instantiation of the essence of a human being it's just a collection of cells and we decide that it hasn't got any rights so therefore mm -hmm. abortion isn't murder that's one um but what happens if someone says no hold on a minute uh i don't really buy this idea that just because you say people have got rights, they really have got rights. I mean, what kind of answer can ultimately be given to that? Um, can someone who denies final causality ever ground rights rationally? I think they try to, but they, uh, 
it's never fully articulated as i mean you you hear the language of rights thrown around so so often and often these are folks that they'll in, in the very next breath they'll help themselves to some version of an atheist materialist paradigm uh which to my mind just it squashes any notion of personhood uh and and, and you can't get rights off the ground uh so yeah i i don't think I don't think unless you can't get full personhood unless you have telos and then you can't get rights unless you have personhood. So I think that's, that's how I see it. Yeah. I mean, how would they say they had discovered rights in, did they find them in a Petri dish? Did they find them in a tree? Did they, did they mm -hmm. weigh them? Did they measure them? What's the formula for rights? How do they interact with the physical world, all those kind of questions that are their baseline assumptions. Rights don't seem to fit in with that easily. There's no essence for what a human being is. Yeah, I thought we were being empirical here. You know, I don't, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't, uh, what's what's my measurement apparatus to, to, to you know, I, I don't have a rightometer that I can, I can use to, to see, you know, like, like I'm trying to, locate ozone or, or, um, you know, how much carbon there is in, in the world. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, once again, it's, it's this, this huge leftover piece that that's in, that, that these folks it, on, like Dennett and company notice though, that like they will invoke or, or Harris, maybe a better example. Harris just the other day, you know, he was appalled that, you know, Kanye West said this, that, or the other thing, and, how, you know, that's so immoral. And, like, you know, it's so the, the ontological furniture that these people, these guys want, like, they, they get, it gets brought in and out of existence as, as to how they want to use it. But it seems like there's, there's no uh, coherent reason as to how they can help themselves to, to, to rights claims at all. Mm. Yeah, and that uh, the self contradiction is one of the hallmarks of error that we've mentioned mm -hmm. a few times in previous lessons, isn't it? We've yeah. just had a question, which is a big one. Um, we'll try and give a quick answer now, but Phaser has a quite a big chunk of the chapter devoted entirely to this. Kant tried to ground rights in reason, the categorical imperative, and Phaser thinks that ultimately uh, this can't be done. Um, why not the the selection of pages on on Kant specifically in chapter five? What's your understanding of that? Let me just uh... I find the right passage here. Ultimately, it comes back to quite big questions about why should people act according to the categorical imperative. So Faser quotes Nietzsche on Kant, calling him a, a catastrophic spider. <laughs> the idea is that it's uh, good to have respect for persons. Um, autonomy is also good. And the dignity of persons is a reason to do all this well phaser says that kant is trying to um, patch up the problems so we've got here um, wouldn't tell a lie when it would lead to an overall good result pass it or if so then the categorical imperative gives conflicting results so is it right to lie or is it not right to lie or suppose you've decided to give all your property to the poor, to forsake ever having a family or home of your own, and to devote the rest of your life ministering to the sick and dying in the streets of Calcutta or Kinshasa. Obviously, if everyone did this, the result would be a complete economic collapse. Millions upon millions of poor people, and indeed, if everyone gave up family life, the extinction of the human race. So would it be immoral for you to do it? 
surely not. And then he says that the idea that reason alone tells us to be moral is sheer bluff. Why exactly should we believe that reason tells us to follow the categorical imperative as opposed to being the slave of the passions in human sense? or following our rational self-interest, as Hobbes says. Kant might respond that people like Hume and Hobbes simply misunderstand the essence or nature of reason, and if so, he'd be exactly right. But where does Kant, of all people, get off appealing to the nature or essence of reason, since his denial that we can know any objective essences or natures of things is, if anything, even more thoroughgoing than that of his predecessors, the whole Kantian project is a complete muddle from start to finish. And there's a lot more on it that you can turn to to get the exact details. But I think ultimately it's that inconsistency we were just talking about earlier. Once you abandon essences, once you abandon human nature, you mm-hmm. have no real right talking about what's objectively good for it. Yeah, yeah. His, um, his anthropology man is off. And now, yeah, you're just you're just a pure rational intellect trying to make decisions um, shorn of any any telos, and that this it's not obvious what 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 would the the rationally good decision would be at that point. Yeah, I, old Bristolian, you asked that question. A good one when you hear that kind of question from people or have similar thoughts yourself is Nietzsche's question: Why truth? It's a good one. Nietzsche knew what he was asking there. Why truth? Why be good? So play difficult and see if you can dig down to the, the fundamental assumptions beneath that. Because you can't give a real answer to why truth apart from the fact that it's what human beings are built for. It's what fulfills us. So it's what's good for us. So being moral is ultimately being rational, which is what a rational creature is designed to do. It's what it's aimed at. On the topic of morality, Fazer actually says, and this is kind of what we've just hinted at with their answer on Kant, there is nothing by reference to which it can be judged objectively right or wrong if we're thinking about any act or thing or person in the absence of final causality. So... When Kant says categorical imperative, um, why? What's the standard for this Um, objectively? Why can't we have any objective standard um, once we have got rid of this reference point of what is good for a thing? What would it be? What could people suggest? Once human nature as what is good for us goes, what else is there? Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's rationality too. It's like too removed from, from human nature at that point, you know, what, like pure reason I, I, that isn't grounded in some reference point of how humans are, uh, doesn't, doesn't really make much sense yeah i don't think it does yeah yeah like good for what right for what and according to what and why Mm -hmm. all these questions if there's no such thing as uh objective human nature i i don't think they even make any sense no and yet as you so often point people keep wanting to smuggle in the idea that some things really are good for us like there's no objective human nature. There's no essence for what it means to be human. Humans aren't for anything. And yet, uh, tolerance is really good. Uh, equality, <laughs> equality is really good. Right, yeah. Yeah, being open-minded. Uh, I don't know. Sh- yeah, showing epistemic charity to your your debate uh, partner. Well, why? <laughs> yeah. why those? Why those values? Exactly it. Nietzsche again. Why truth? Why be good? Mm-hmm. So, Fazer says that an atheist or naturalist can believe in morality, but he cannot have a rational justification for his belief. And you hear this quite a lot. So, someone might say, This is ridiculous. Uh, Dawkins cares about animal welfare, uh, Dawkins cares about 
helping the sick. Atheists aren't all bad people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to have an atheist friend that he, he, he would always frame the question wrong. He would always say to me, so wait, so you're telling me atheists can't be moral? And I'm like, no, that that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that atheism can't ground morality. That's the proper way to, to phrase it, not, not the other way around. Right. You might even have an atheist who is doing a better job of conforming to natural law. So behaving in a way that is rational and good for a human being to behave, given the nature mm -hmm. of a human being, than yeah. a particularly depraved Christian, for example. Right. That doesn't yeah. mean that his worldview can account for any of those things, whereas mm -hmm. the Christians mm -hmm. can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As a reminder, why is this? Why couldn't your atheist friend's worldview give any kind of rational justification for morality? People who've been listening carefully over the last few lessons will probably already think of the answer. But in a nutshell, what is it? What would you tell that friend? Well, uh, let's consider what presuppositions that we have that are built into claims like uh, you ought to be tolerant. Uh, you know, tolerance is a, is a good thing for people to, to uh, take part in. Well, you need uh, other minds, right? You need at least your mind. Well, I guess you do need other minds. You need somebody to be tolerant too. Uh, so you need uh, agency. Uh, and then you need a, a better or worse, you know, why it is that something is objectively better to be tolerant than, than not tolerant. Mm -hmm. all, all of these things are um, not to be found in a, a purely naturalistic or purely materialist ontology. You know, so we've already imported three major things, agency, mind, uh, free will, for, and uh, uh, four things, uh, objective morality. Uh, they go well beyond just just a, a naturalistic and materialistic worldview. Uh, so we're left with that, and then you know we're also left with questions of how do we how do we explain the intelligibility of the world at all? You know how do we explain uh, you know that mathematics works? Uh, you know all the other all the other like interesting ontological things that are out there, mm. and uh, I think that gets us back to well, looks like uh, theism. Theism is a pretty good candidate for grounding all those things. So, you know, the, the being that is capital B being. Right. And the, the reason why this smuggling in keeps happening is that these are objective features of reality. They, f they forget the game they're playing and they actually stop mm -hmm. talking about what's yeah. real. And mm -hmm. then they have to play this, mental uh gymnastics game of saying oh no hold on a minute oh i i thought um on our world view that we actually those things don't exist and they're always having to catch themselves in the act of contradicting what they claim mm -hmm. to believe yeah, yeah. so the, of course the smuggling happens constantly yeah yeah and e even as something as subtle as dawkins saying that selfish genes are have aims right or, or have ends you know so even even the, the the hint of teleological language gets smuggled in, into into their physicalist worldview right we'll be looking at that in the next chapter aristotle's revenge and ironically i think you see it in biology especially so yeah. uh we're at a dead end now i think if ever there was one in history thinking about particular the the trans issue which is the one that you were woken up by in some ways uh, oh, yeah. many people have been in the same way so mm. what i mean by dead end is where next if we're now saying that there's no essential difference between men and women and there's no objective meaning value or purpose to human true people, truth can <laughs> invent yeah. what they want to be there's no truth right yeah. it's hard to see where you go from there and we're on the the train ride that started a few stops back and we've arrived mm, at mm. crazy town now <laughs> yeah yeah we uh definitely are so, <laughs> why are you laughing fell, <laughs> fell you asleep 
I missed my stop. I missed my stop, Will. You know, I was <laughs> supposed to get off. Fell asleep in the car. And now, yeah, it's pretty. It's <laughs> all full steam ahead to Crazy Town. Uh, but that doesn't but mean yeah. it's bad, though, right? No, not not at all. I mean, truth truth is truth, and uh, you know, we, we can always have that that reference point. Truth truth will reassert itself one way or the other. Uh, it's just a question of how you know how messy or or how comfortable it's going to be. Yeah, and I think that things will get worse before they get better. And as the doctrine of the apocalypse tells us, uh, we should expect things to be getting worse and worse mm -hmm. gradually. Yep. And there's some sense in which on the deepest level, uh, this is a losing battle. But mm -hmm. because we're built for the resurrection, then there's ultimate victory. And yes. All you can do is try to hold together uh, your own life and your family's life. And that is the big thing that ultimately is going to affect society anyway. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't expect things to suddenly turn around. Although Fazer does say that the only possible remedy now left is to go back to first principles, because this is where the mistakes ultimately stem from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that that's the project of really this book and of this, this, uh, this podcast is for us to, to sort through and figure out what, you know, where are the first principles that we need to get back to. And we've talked about final causality as being a big one. And mm -hmm. one of the points you like to make often is the anthropology of man. And yes. I think fundamentally that is what liberalism gets wrong. Uh, we've got a, a couple of minutes now. Just give us a quick recap on what you mean by the anthropology of man and why you think this is the starting point that we need to rebuild from. Right. So if we look at the Aristotelian Aristotelmus worldview and the anthropology of man as have as humans being essentially goal directed, as you know, men having the potential hood to realize as fathers, women realizing their potential as mothers, families realizing, and then it building towards a, a holistic society. Uh, and all those things having a final end uh, that is goal directed and that is that in achieving their final end uh, results in their ultimate flourishing and in eudaimonia. If that picture of man is removed and then you don't have an essential woman you don't have an essential man and we're just you know either you know some version of of a, a lockean tabula rasa or a hobbesian you know animal in a state of nature or rousseau general will or a, or a kantian you know rational intellect what you're left with them is you don't then is you don't have natural law, you don't have an organic society, you just have some some ad hoc version of contractualism that you have to like bolt together and, you know, whoever can tell the best story, uh, so be it. Um, but then it lends itself also to this, this view of radical self authorship, and you can just speak your own nature in and out of existence, uh, or just do do what thou wilt, you know, pursue your own pleasure, pursue your own happiness. And uh, the extreme version of that, I think, is is this tra the trans stuff. Uh, but you can see how that 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 breaking away from a man having an essential nature with a telos towards a final end that that breaks away, and you run the iteration several hundred years, and now now we're at we're at crazy town. That's it. So we use the example that Phaser gives of the fact that it's good for the squirrel being a squirrel to collect its acorns ready for the winter. That's mm. what squirrels do. That's what helps them flourish. And the idea is that if we get the anthropology of man correct, then this will lead to our flourishing because we're doing what we are built by nature for. And this mm. whole idea that the, the sexes are just a, a social construct, for example, uh, that has made a fundamental mistake because uh, society itself is natural. Mm -hmm. Human beings right. naturally are social animals. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the individual isn't the fundamental building block of the human world. The, the family is. 
we're oriented towards family and towards society as a consequence of that. So mm. that's a big part of what we mean by going back to first principles. What is a human being from that? What is good for a human being? And then we take the steps from there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well said. It, yeah, society isn't this this artificial thing that is now impeding the individual's will. Rather, society and individual are both nat naturally and organically connected. It's yeah, part it's, part of one another. Right. So, people listening, if someone says, uh, "What um, do you think that masculinity, femininity, is a social construct?" You can actually say yes, it is, but society mm. itself is Elf, natural, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So being a man, being a woman, that comes with a whole set of duties. Like you are for a particular purpose as potential father, as potential mother, and society is built on that. And that's where we get the idea about um, community from and nations ultimately stemming from that if you start mm. with the individual as the fundamental building block and we've got this atomistic or pulverized reality that phaser describes mm. then you never end up putting things back together because of the universal asset there's no bonds there's no duty connecting people you don't put things back together and it sets the individual in almost an antagonistic relationship to the the natural society that that's there right yep good note to finish on any final questions we've got a couple of minutes left uh is society trying to do the impossible by mixing the two viewpoints and the two viewpoints there i think this was about uh on the one hand the mechanistic worldview so manipulating nature becoming masters of it and on the other hand trying to have a worldview where morality is real. I think you can't have both for the reasons Dr. Robard, Robillard explained. You can't ground morality or meaning or value or purpose in a reductivist, materialistic worldview. So yeah, it is impossible in principle. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, it looks like those are all the questions. We're trying to keep these under 59 minutes because we're going to use them for a separate project. But it's been good to have the questions coming in. Hope you've enjoyed it. And we look forward to seeing you next week for the final chapter, looking at Aristotle's revenge. Dr. Roblod, thank you as always. Thank you. Good seeing you guys. Thanks for being Take here. Take care, everyone.